I'm delighted to introduce Claire. She is an, currently a Leaving Home Early Career Research Fellow at Queen Mary University of London. And she's working on free thought and secularism in periodicals in 19th century Britain at the moment. She's previously co-edited a collection of historical sources uh, in a series which is 19th century religion literature and culture and she's uh, claire correct me if i get this wrong at all but she's co-edited the volume that is disbelief and new beliefs and which is a fantastic collection of sources because it is so gender balanced apart from that claire is the author of a wonderful book constance naden scientist philosopher, poet, as well as numerous articles about Constance Naden. And Claire has really been central in restoring Naden back into the history of philosophy. And as you can see, it's Constance Naden that Claire's going to talk about to us today. So over to you, Claire. Thanks so much, Alison. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, wonderful to be invited uh, to talk with you today about this. Um, yeah, really sort of trying to think about um, how Naden fits into this um, broader sort of scope of philosophy in the 19th century. As a caveat, I am um, by background a literature scholar um, and one of the sort of things that I found most rewarding about having started this work on sort of Naden's philosophy very much if you read my book I think from quite a sort of literary angle is that then others over the last sort of five years or so, um, including Alison uh, herself has written sort of wonderfully um, about Naden as, as well as some others, all of whom I'm gonna talk about uh, in the paper over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly um, I don't think I was speaking to justice uh, to Naden as a philosopher, um, but I'm, I'm, and I'm constantly delighted to read other people um, and what they're finding in Naden's works, especially those who are much more sort of embedded in the history of philosophy as a sort of discipline, which is something that I've come to a bit later in my kind of research career. Um, so yes, let me uh, introduce uh, this woman on the slide. In 1881, Constance Caroline Woodhill Naden uh, enrolled at Birmingham's Mason Science College. She contributed two articles on Hylozoist philosophy to the Journal of Science, and she published her first volume of poems. At the age of 2023, sorry, at the age of 23, her diverse interests and accomplishments were already well established. Throughout the 1880s, she pursued three strands of intellectual endeavour, poetry, philosophy and science, which were for her all part of a synthetic world scheme through which she sought to unify the realms of human thought. Naden's legacy has primarily been as a poet. Certainly that was the case um, sort of up until um, sort of uh, maybe perhaps till I came along around sort of uh, 2013 or so, um, whose comic, lyric and narrative poems speak to contemporary topics such as evolutionary theories and the figure of the new woman. Um, in my book, Constance Naden, Scientist, Philosopher, Poet, shown there um, on the screen, I sought to broaden out from this perspective, emphasising the importance of her, of her philosophy and also her identity as a free thinker or atheist, um, which I'll also come back to, of course, in a bit, um, which really were the elements of her life's work that she prioritised. Um, she didn't really sort of um, see herself as a poet, even though um, that was probably how she became most um, visibly successful in her lifetime. Um, since then, um, others, um, include, a lot, as I said, including Alison Stone, also Emily Thomas, um, have turned their attention to Naden's significant contributions to 19th century philosophy. And in this talk, I'll introduce some of these key ideas outlining Naden's cumulative philosophical practice through which she synthesised diverse knowledge to develop a secular theory of life and mind. Um, and really, I'm going to start with a... Um, overview of her um, 
a person of her life just to give a sense of who we're talking about, uh, where she was and when she was. Um, so she was born in Birmingham in uh, England in 1856 and brought up by her maternal grandparents in the prosperous suburb of Edgbaston. She was the only child of their daughter Caroline who died less than two weeks after giving birth to Constance. Nathan's grandparents were supportive and generous and she attended a Unitarian school where she received a wide-ranging education, excelling in painting and storytelling. It was only after leaving school at 17 that Nathan's talents for languages, for sciences and for philosophy became apparent, which really coincided with her introduction in 1876 to Robert Lewins, who was committed to spreading the word about a philosophy that he at this point called Hylozoism. The poetry and prose in her unpublished notebooks from 1875 to 78, which are now held at the University of Birmingham, indicate a steady shift away from her inherited religious um, beliefs and a growing interest in philosophy during this period. With Lewins's encouragement, she became proficient in French, German, Latin and Greek and corresponded about the scientific and philosophical works that she was reading. In 1879, she joined the Birmingham and Midland Institute, this is sort of a working man's sort of educational institute, uh, working people's, um, to take classes in German and botany. And then in 1881, she enrolled at the Mason College of Science, which became the University of Birmingham in 1900. So she's really one of the sort of earliest um, students of what became the University of Birmingham. She studied over six years here um, as she took classes um, across chemistry, physiology, geology, physics, zoology. She won college prizes um, and then she was also publishing uh, poetry, songs and sonnets of springtime in 1881, A Modern Apostle, The Elixir of Life, The Story of Clarice and other poems in 1887. She was editing the Mason College um, student magazine, but also contributing philosophical and social science writing to popular science periodicals such as Knowledge and the Journal of Science and free thought periodicals such as the Secular Review, National Reformer and Our Corner. In 1883 she produces a Hilo Idealist pamphlet in collaboration with Lewins titled What is Religion? A Vindication of Free Thought. Um, and then in 1887, her grandmother sadly dies. Her grandfather had already died a few years before that. And this sort of seems to have freed Naden somewhat to um, leave Mason College, leave Birmingham and travel through the Middle East and India with a widowed companion, Madeline Daniel. And upon their return to Britain, um, they actually moved to London. The final two years of Naden's life were characterised by burgeoning uh, political activity um, and writing certainly but she doesn't really publish during this time. Um, in July 1889 she wrote to um, William Hughes who became her biographer quote my book gets on slowly but I hope surely. I cannot say when it will be finished there won't be a mag op at all a magnum opus for ideas have an uncomfortable habit of developing as one writes and requiring alterations in their clothing. Uh, feeling that I think may be familiar to many of us who are sort of writing in various forms. Um, but Naden, um, Naden's really was a life that you can consider to be cut short. Um, she dies in December 1889 um, at the age of 31. Um, and at this point, it seems that she was sort of developing a kind of new direction in philosophy that kind of gets published um, post posthumously. But whether you can conceive it to be a sort of like fully a fully formed sort of iteration of where she was going with that you know of course it's sort of ahistorical to speculate but that's nonetheless um sort of something that I think it's worth noting um but despite being cut off in her prime perhaps she left us a lot to read both her published writing and this in progress work um, was published posthumously as I say in two volumes um here with just their contents pages to give you a sense of them they're both on archive.org so they're actually very accessible though there aren't any modern editions of her work um, and this happily means it's very straightforward um, to both read the depth and breadth of her philosophical writings and also, as we're thinking about, of course, diversifying um, curricula to also assign it to students as well. It's not something you have to be sort of photocopying from obscure um, places. <laughs> 
Um, so college, Mason College contemporaries of Naden playfully referred to her as Hypatia, a mark of recognition of her serious philosophical persona, and also perhaps an acknowledgement of the free thinking nature of Naden's ideas, Hypatia being one of many classical figures co-opted by 19th century secularists. For example, she appears in J.M. Wheeler's biographical dictionary of free thinkers of all ages and nations um, as pagan philosopher as Mar and martyr. Um, and Naden really was interested in the history of philosophy and sort of the history of ideas and also the history of the philosophical me method um, and the induction and deduction uh, that gives the title of the first of the two volumes of her essays um, is actually based on an extended essay that she wrote at Mason College. She won a um, prize for it in 1887. Um, and as the long unwieldy subtitle, subtitle indicates, um, it was considered to be a historical and critical sketch of successive philosophical conceptions respecting the relations between inductive and deductive thought. And she really does um, sort of move through um, the gamut of uh, philosophical history, beginning with uh, what she calls the Greek cosmologist and concluding with the British idealist Thomas Hill Green, who was her contemporary. She asserts that induction and deduction should be understood as mutual relations, um, describing I've got skip on too far. Um, that describing them as a process of quote cognition involving recognitions and a process of recognition involving cognitions, respectively. Um, and she also articulated her views um, about philosophy as a discipline, um, focusing in this art, in this uh, essay on reason over faith and also the unifying nature of free thought, of philosophical thought, um, which are things that she sort of returns to um, frequently in her writings. Um, and so this unifying um, concept extends itself to the question of disciplines, and um, she really does prioritise interdisciplinary thinking drawing upon and synthesizing both forms and ideas associated with the arts and the sciences to express what she calls regularly unity in diversity. Um, this appears in several of her works. I've just got one example on the slide here at the top. Um, this slide shows a particularly notable example of, I think, this sort of interdisciplinary work in action. Um, here there's a um, one of a pair, what well, the end rather, of one of a pair of sonnets titled Starlight that articulate a secular wonder um, that is rooted in scientific knowledge. It concludes, and see wherever sun or spark is lit, one law, one life, one substance, infinite. Her poems are therefore incorporating rather than contrasting with um, science and philosophy. Um, poetry for Naden was a flexible, questioning and synthetic medium that I think freed her from the formal constraints of scientific and philosophical prose to pursue unknowns, whether philosophical, sociological or psychological. And um, there's a sort of sense that maybe you don't need a definitive answer if you're writing a sonnet. Uh, Ermtraud Huber, who has also written recently, um, published um, on her on Naden, um, emphasizes the importance of attending to this facet of Naden's writing, arguing, quote, that Naden's poetry can often be seen to reconsider and adjust and even to critically probe her philosophical positions, particularly in relation to its ethical consequences. Um, we find that the philosopher poets of the German Romantic tradition served as a model for Naden to do this kind of synthetic, um, synthetic writing and thought. Um, she particularly admired Friedrich Schiller as, um, and wrote an essay about him as a philosophic poet. She calls him a seer and singer, a twice-souled mort twice mortal who possesses both vision and voice. And again, that's the quote at the bottom of the slide. Her own interdisciplinary approach demonstrated by the function of imagination in her philosophical prose um, sort of is situated as both an explanatory tool and a methodology. Um, so we have imaginative formulations often grounded in scientific and artistic metaphors underpinned by her explanations of abstract or more complicated concepts. For example, her description of how sensory impulses come together to create individuals' perception of the world encompassed both optical science, whereby the brain focuses converging rates of light from all parts of the body and unites them into the white light of consciousness, um, 
so I don't have that put up on the slide. So that's the kind of scientific um, optical science way of uh, understanding um, perception of the world. Um, but then in the same um, essay, uh, describes it through the idea of painting a picture. Um, so she also writes, every one of us creates nature herself in a tiny cerebral studio without pencil and without pigment. So we're um, often being given these sort of alternative ways of sort of um, understanding philosophy, sort of thinking about it through scientific and sort of more art artistic um, sort of metaphors and analogies often, but also it seems to speak to her sort of wider sense that actually um, these sort of artistic and scientific ways of understanding sort of our subjectivities, that's kind of an important thing to reckon with, that there are different ways that you might understand the world, but actually they kind of unify into sort of some kind of sing singular thing. Um, so in 1888, Naden was made the first female associate of Mason College, its highest academic honour at that point. Um, they weren't yet a degree giving organisation. Um, she hadn't worked towards a degree, though. She could have done one um, through the Kensington Science and Art Department, which was a kind of um, offering degrees um, for uh, people who are studying in various places across Britain. Um, but rather than doing this, she um, focused instead on trying to get a deep knowledge of the physical and biological sciences as a foundation for her academically rigorous philosophy. Um, reflecting explicitly on the necessity of undertaking a breadth of study, she proclaimed, and we've got this on the slide here, no single truth can be isolated except for convenience's sake from the general body of truth. It is impossible to learn piecemeal. William Tilden, professor of chemistry at Mason College and a friend of hers uh, who uh, wrote um, part of uh, the, the posthumous memoir, uh, the biography of her, um, he observed after her death that, quote, no inducement seems sufficient to prevail upon her to become a mere scientific specialist, and that she had come to Mason College with the intention to gather for herself the elements of the synthetic philosophy which she thought to pursue as a life's work. So Naden developed what she deemed to be the true creed of the scientific secularist, uh, that's a quote from 1883, um, and how this sort of manifested itself was a synthetic, idealist, materialist philosophy that rejected dualism. In collaboration with Robert Lewins, a retired army surgeon, she applied concepts from across the social and physical sciences to establish a monism that emphasised the unity of the mind, body and the universe. Um, avowedly atheist and rationalist, through this philosophy she, she sought to free humanity from superstition and religion. She instead posited that the universe could be explained in terms of the indwelling energy and matter and the scientific laws that govern it. Her works emphasise the awe and wonder inherent in these. And in um, what might be seen as sort of a, one of the at least sort of manifesto statements of what this uh, philosophy was called Hilo Idealism, the creed of the coming day, which she first published as CN, so sort of anonymously, in Annie Besant's Free Thinking Monthly, Our Corner, in 1884, Naden asserted, Our universe is made up of sensations, for even thought may be described as the special sensation of the cerebral cortex, and beyond sensation we cannot pass. Even Heil, the substance, the unknowable, if you will, must be defined in terms of thought, so that we may accurately enough style ourselves Hilo idealists. The tension between idealism and materialism in Naden's world scheme has come under recent scrutiny. In Emily Thomas's contribution to the Oxford Handbook of American and British Women Philosophers in the 19th century, um, that's, uh, that came out just last year, she considers Naden's secular idealism in relation to Arabella Buckley's and Victoria Welby's idealisms that were grounded in theism. Uh, Thomas concludes that Naden's philosophy is not grounded in materialism. Despite Naden's frequent recourse to the term matter in her writings, according to Thomas, this term is used to describe the fundamentally unknown, quote, world beyond mind, including the nature of our minds. That's sorry, quoting Thomas rather than Naden. 
and that the term matter has been chosen by Naden um, for its simplicity and because it doesn't invite speculation about spiritual or theistic underpinnings, which the word a word such as the unknown might. There's a sort of sense of the agnostic in the unknown. But as we'll see, Naden actually is very much committed atheist, but she still thinks there is perhaps something beyond um, the sort of knowable matter. Um, that's uh, certainly um, Thomas's view. But others um, have argued that Naden's engagement um, with idealist traditions, um, particularly via the words of Kant, uh, the most frequently referenced individual in her collected writings, and uh, with T.H. Green, mean that her core philosophical ideas were centred on attempting to reconcile idealism with materialism. Uh, Alison Stone writes, it is ultimately Naden's materialism about the mind that drives her idealism. Uh, Naden termed her position relative idealism, whereby, and this is from one of Naden's um, writings, matter so far from being a non-entity is the fons et origo of all entities. And this is because all thoughts and perceptions arise from the physiological functioning of brain cells rather than anything intangible like spirit. Um, Stone observes that, quote, for her time, Naden was unusual in the boldness with which she rejected dualism in favour of an atheist world scheme founded upon monist materialism. Um, and Stone also draws attention to what she considers to be the intractable problems underlying high idealist attempts to reconcile idealism and materialism, um, which uh, were then in part elaborated by Helena Blavatsky. And so that's in an article um, by um, Alison Stone from 2022, um, where she also considers uh, Blavatsky's thought in more detail as well. And then we have Ermtraud Huber. Um, who has explored in depth how Naden's often challenging monism collapses the boundaries between mind and matter and radically decenters the human subject, that's Huber's terms. Um, Huber fruitfully characterizes the attendant reconciliation of ego and cosmos as producing, quote, a dynamic net of endless interdependence that dissolves into material relations. Um, so um, I'm going to admit, as I, as I say, I come from a literature studies background. I'm not sure I am actually the person um, to adjudicate on the relative merits of Thomas Stone and Huber's um, respective assessments of precisely what ac most accurately describes Naden's philosophy in terms of this sort of idealist materialist um, tension or sort of rubbing up against each other. And so I really just think for me, what is um, most uh, telling really is the development of a scholarly conversation around Naden's work, which really, I think, demonstrates its complexity um, and the need for others to reflect upon and respond to Naden's writings. There's a huge amount for students and researchers alike to um, explore and sort of draw out. I think there's sort of new directions to take and to sort of, um, I'm excited to see where it takes uh, different people. Um, the relative nature of uh, idealism that Naden put forward, in which material reality was not denied, was emphasised in Hilo Idealism, The Creed of the Coming Day, in which Naden explains that external objects exist independently, but they are perceived subjectively only via the me mechanisms of human perception, scientifically understood. Because the world is necessarily mediated by sense organs, each individual's brain nonetheless has a creative function. As a result, everyone holds within themselves the sense and being of everything they perceive through a process of a selfment. Um, that's the term that Naden uses. Consequently, as I have at the top of this slide, um, Naden writes, two interlocutors are like opposite mirrors. Each, among other objects, reflects its vis-a-vis -vis and therefore reflects its own reflection. The mirrors may be cracked or clouded, convex or concave. Still, in however distorted a form, each may be said to contain its opposite neighbour. And, were mirrors sentient beings, the mutual inclusion would be psychical as well as physical. True intersubjectivity was therefore impossible, but all organisms were nonetheless fundamentally bound together relationally, relationally in a manner that necessitated complete synthesis or universal unity. 
To pursue the idea of interlocutors that Naden raises here, it's important to note the, um, that the exposition of Hilo idealism was a shared endeavour with Robert Lewins. A particular interest in this regard is the pamphlet Humanism versus Theism, published in 1887, which comprises several edited letters from Lewins to Naden, dating from around November 1878 to February 1879. Um, and then there's also a later preface by Naden in Humanism versus Theism. Her 1878-79 to 79 notebook covers this letter writing period um, and provides insights into um, her initial response to Lewin's. Um, and here is where we get this um, quote that I have in the centre of the slide, in which she concludes an uh, entry of the uh, sort of notebook saying, It is exquisite delight to the man of abstract thought if he finds but one cognate and sympathetic mind into which he can grow his own which is a slightly sort of perhaps odd and uncomfortable uh, metaphor uh, for thinking about um, the sort of the perhaps the relationship, at least at this stage, between um, Constance Naden, who is sort of just 20 and a sort of a, a much sort of older retired man and thinking about their sort of um, their sort of philosophical engagement with each, with each other and how, um, at least at this point, there seems to be a kind of mentor mentee teacher student relationship. But then if one is growing one's mind into someone else's, you feel there's a kind of mutuality there. Um, and certainly um, as Naden's writing sort of um, gained confidence, um, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, through the um, 1880s, um, her, her work really does diverge quite significantly um, from Lewin's. Um, but it's sort of interesting to think, as I say, about this idea of philosophical interlocutors through this lens, I think. Um, so... Um, Yes, I therefore think it's worth reflecting upon these questions of collaboration, dialogue and mentor-mentee relations. Um, and she does sort of really frame herself as part of a partnership with Lewins, um, for example, in one place she um, aligns their endeavour with the collaborative works of the Renaissance dramatists Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. Um, but there is also a clear tension between Naden and Lewins, and these play out most clearly in his editorial footnotes to her essays, in which Lewins often sought to clarify or correct Naden's articulations of her ideas, um, which he often seemed to think of as his, or at least exactly cognate with his. The tension in part stemmed from differences in their approaches to writing philosophy. Naden was committed to plain speaking, clear phrasing, familiar examples, and these contrast with Lewin's convoluted syntax and overcomplicated vocabulary. In the brain theory of mind and matter, Naden explained that prose should be understood as simply a, quote, more or less efficient vehicle for the conveyance of ideas to the understanding and later stated, I am writing not for empirical or other philosophers, but for the general reader. And that's from one of her sort of final essays called Cosmic Identity. There's been this sort of prevailing historical and critical assessment um, that does um, really emphasise this uh, position of Naden as an adherent to Hilo idealism, a philosophy um, conceived originally, certainly, by Robert Lewins. Um, but I do want to point your attention towards a forthcoming article by um, Emily Thomas, which she's clearly, which she has kindly shared a preprint of, um, and I just note the details at the bottom of this slide, um, in which she really carefully distinguishes between the metaphysics delineated by Naden and by Lewins, and really finds both mutual influence and the important differences that I, th that I do agree, and um, now I read this, that others have really overlooked. Um, and particularly, she identifies how Naden's openness to unknown agents, as she calls them in her 1879 note, notebook, and extension of reality beyond our mental worlds, is utterly at odds with Lewins's refusal to entertain any element of dualism that would allow for unknown matter. And so Naden does really use this idea of the unknown in sort of specific and useful ways, and in a way that Lewins, even in his footnotes to her writing, will sort of push back against and say, oh, th this is not exactly what I mean by this. Um, but actually, it seems that Naden is clearly taking a different path. Um, and yes, Thomas also um, in this work on um, 
uh, the ideal known world and unknown matter in um, Naden also highlights her sustained engagement with Kantian theses and connections to T.H. Huxley's evolutionism. So please, yeah, do look out for that when it comes out, hopefully later in this year. Um, in my own work, I've identified how Naden's dislike of dogmatism, her wide ranging but nonetheless deep engagement with contemporary science and connections with the radical free thought movement broaden the scope of her contributions to 19th century ideas about life and mind. Her keen interest in the works of Herbert Spencer and in the burgeoning field of social science led her to develop the concept of cosmic identity. And it's notable that um, in the sort of later works on cosmic identity, she doesn't use the term hyloidealism at all. Um, these essays, which were printed as philosophical tracts in Further Relics from 1891, um, articulated her most independent and developed philosophy in which she delineates a more expansive synthetic philosophy and argues for the importance of translating philosophical ideals, quote, not only into simple words, but into concrete actions. Um, and she's really um, keen to um, think through the idea of man as, quote, a social being so that society not only encompass him, encompasses him, but constitutes his very mind and character. So we have this idea that connection with each other is crucial to understanding the human mind and human behaviour. And she pursues relational concepts such as morality, welfare and intelligence. Um, and she sort of comes to articulate the nature of knowledge and reason in terms of, quote, the law of cosmic identity, a form of materialism that entailed, quote, not a unity of substance or being which makes no provision for diversities and indeed expressly excludes them, but a unity of relation which at once implies diversities and renders them intelligible. The cosmos as we know it in space and time displays wealth of variety, yet is synthesized as the one in many are by the persistence of fundamental relations. On this slide, I place this quote in the context of a much longer passage, as you can see, which I certainly won't read out, but I wanted to include it because if you do have a chance to go back to it, it exemplifies how interdisciplinary thinking was at the core of her philosophy, here the emphasis being on the mutuality of scientific and poetic understandings of the universe. Um, I'm going to skip through this a little bit, um, but I just wanted to thought it might be helpful when we're thinking about how you might introduce um, a sort of a new philosopher into sort of uh, the classroom and so on, that thinking about her connections and networks within sort of more established um, philosophical um, sort of groups in the 19th century. Um, in this regard, I think um, it's her sort of peripheral connection to the group of thinkers associated with Charles Bray's Rose Hill home that is most important. Um, the clearest intellectual and personal collection was with Herbert Spencer, and I'll come back to that. But significant too was that she was acquainted with um, Charles and Caroline Bray, free thinking theists. Um, Lewins actually took her to meet them, so Lewins knew them too. Um, and it's reported later that Charles Bray came to regularly read her poem, The Pantheist Song of Immortality, as his Sunday morning psalm. Um, she also corresponded with Henry G. Atkinson, and she sort of engages on a sort of more um, sort of philosophical level as well with um, George Henry Lewes and George Eliot. I talk about, about that a bit in my book. Um, and for all of these thinkers, there is an element of um, the desire to find this sort of unity in variety, all law in one laws, these kinds of sort of unifying synthetic philosophies are um, taken in different directions by um, the people named on this slide, um, but I think sort of resonate in interesting ways with Naden, even if her sort of the staunchness of her atheism, I think, takes her sort of outside and away from the kind of um, theist um, and sort of more maybe agnostic ways of thinking about them. Um, but as I say, it's Herbert Spencer um, that she has the most um, strong connection or sort of association with. Um, it's still not clear whether they actually met in person. Um, there's no evidence for that. But she was in direct correspondence with him. Um, she wrote a rebuttal article at his behest um, to something that had been published in the fortnightly, although that didn't end up getting uh, published. It does appear in um, pig in further relics as pig philosophy. Um, so you can follow that up if you're interested. Um, and uh, yes, she sort of becomes more and more interested in sociology, uh, with Herbert Spencer being the kind of person who really inaugurates the discipline of um, sociology in the sort of British context. So that's a clear um, sort of important connection. Um, 
the sort of most high profile way in which he writes about her is actually um, in a sort of quite bizarre um, letter um, in which he says, I can think of no woman save George Eliot in whom there has been this union of high philosophical capacity with extensive acquisition. And um, that's the bit that I've included on the slide here. Um, the bit I haven't included on the slide is on the next page where he notes the um, physiological cost to women with highly developed mental powers and suggests really that perhaps the reason she has died so young is because she's a woman trying to do philosophy. Um, but nonetheless, there's this sort of real engagement um, by Naden um, with Spencer's works. Um, and she was particularly yeah, sort of influenced by this idea of a synthetic system of philosophy and um, his desire to locate truths which unify. And as I say, his development of sociology as a discipline. Um, and it's in her final public lecture in October 1889, um, in which she observed that, quote, sociology demands the concurrence of all the sciences to furnish its raw materials and to work out lines on which it must proceed. So she sees it as very much a synthetic science, and that's perhaps what sort of draws her to it. Um, so Nathan's writings were certainly coinciding with and also building on Spencer's um, data of ethics in particular. And she's um, her sort of main argument really is that we need to think um, more fully about the place of sympathy and altruism in a functional society. Um, and she emphasizes the importance of mutual understanding on the collect of the collective over the individual. Um, and so that's this sort of quote on the right hand of the slide. Um, in which she sort of show, suggests that um, you can view ethics and morals entirely separately from religious doctrine, um, saying that uh, sympathy, whether crystallised into principles and ideals or still in the fluent stage of spontaneous feeling, constitutes more moral vitality and no moral advance can take place except by means of rationally guided sympathy. So this use of rationality here is very much being deemed as a kind of a binary counterpoint to a sort of a, a sort of faith based system of morality. Um, so now I'm just going to turn to this sort of um, atheist free thinking side of her work, which really does underpin um, everything. Uh, but she was actively also contributing to um, the free thought movement. Um, so the free thought movement is a predominantly working class network of atheists, agnostics and secularists that rose to prominence in the second half of the 19th century. Um, but sort of Naden, obviously not the working class part, but does um, sort of engage with this um, quite actively by sort of publishing in their periodicals, um, by sort of uh, what is religion, her sort of pamphlet comes out with um, a free thought publishing company. Um, and really um, what she's sort of keen to do, um, as, as it sort of says in the top of this sort of top quote on the slide, um, that she seeks to undermine the claims of religions with an argument grounded in reason, concluding with a hopeful call to instead make science itself a wellspring of ideal truth. Her essay, um, Hilo Idealism, The Creed of the Coming Day, was written originally for a free thinking audience, as I've already mentioned, it appeared in Annie Besant's Our Corner. Um, and here she outlines how Hilo Idealism entailed, quote, a complete reversal of the theologic standpoint. Um, and she posits that a scientific understanding of nerve and brain function necessitates that the grey thought cells, here met metaphorically labelled God, but she said if you read it in its sort of fullness, um, she's sort of very actively playing with this idea of what people choose to call God. Um, but it is these grey thought cells um, that, while not a first cause, since a stimulus is needed to set them in action, are certainly the only authentic creator of the world as yet discovered by science, philosophy or religion. So this idea of actually finding evidence um, for sort of creation and first, first causes um, that sort of take us away from a religious output is sort of key here. And she also is very explicit about what she calls the unthinkable dogmas of Christian belief um, that were constantly were constantly being challenged in her work, saying that the spirit, the ghost, the pneuma, which originally signified neither more than le or less than the human breath, um, which uh, ceases with human life, is transmuted from mere gas, from a scientific perspective, bound by the law of pneumatics, to an immaterial being tainted by inherited sin. So you've got this sort of idea that, again, religion is always sort of obscuring truth rather than revealing it. 
And I think also Nathan's approach here is quite typical in that she's kind of seeking to communicate the scientific education she was receiving at Mason College by using contemporary biology and physics to provide a materialist account of the universe. Um, it's notable that Naden's discourses upon religious subjects tend to argue with archetypes rather than disputing specific writings or named philosophers. This approach to challenging and questioning belief is indicative of how Naden's writings were influenced by free thought texts such as Charles Bradlaugh's Doubts in Dialogue, which were published in the National Reformer between 1884 and 87. Um, and Naden was also publishing in the National Reformer. Um, so that's just shown on the left hand of the slide what those looks like, um, for example, the Christian priest and unbeliever, um, their imagined conversations um, between those on very, very different ends of the belief spectrum and really seeking to undermine theological positions by exposing their ostensibly illogical foundations. And I think their influence can really be traced in Naden's dialogues. So we have in Cosmic Identity, um, a sort of a dialogue between a neo-Socrates and the recalcitrant reader. Um, and also even in her poetry, where um, in this poem, for, um, it's a very singular example, but this poem, Recipicentia, um, Naden articulates tensions between theistic and secular thought through three interlocutors who express pessimist, born again Christian and free thinking perspectives respectively. So again, we see here that in poetry and prose, Naden is using this form of dialogue drawing on the Socratic mode, um, but also drawing on this sort of free thought tradition and also playing on a 19th century pedagogic tradition more broadly. And um, this is uh, the dialogue is often a way that science education was being communicated in sort of child friendly and sort of popular audience formats. So it's accessible, recognisable um, and hope. And uh, yeah, I think, as again, this sort of idea of um, accessibility is really key for Naden, as well as really sort of thinking, you know, deeply um, and in complex ways about these sort of big questions of life and mind. So drawing towards the end now, um, towards the end of her life, Naden was developing a profile within the sphere of academic philosophy. Most notably, this manifested in her being invited to give a paper at the Aristotelian Society, which she had joined in December 1888 and been very active in sort of the course of 89. Um, her untimely death prevented her from um, presenting this paper, which I think really would have raised her profile within the British philosophical community. But her notes were, stamped, were published in their um, proceedings as um, in sort of two parts, one on rationalist and empiricist ethics and the other on mental physiology and its place in philosophy. Um, and this was alongside a short obituary, which concluded by her death, the society loses one of its most valuable members. The subsequent legacy of Naden's thought was short-lived, despite her friend's best efforts to keep her name and work visible, not least by commissioning um, the bust shown here on this slide, um, which was created for um, the Mason College Library and is still um, actually at the University of Birmingham in the Special Collections Room. Um, and unusually, it sits on this pedestal of books, um, the, uh, the uh, spines of which read um, Naden's uh, titles of Naden's poetic and philosophical works. So there's this real sense that she is sort of, it, we are to continue reading her writings, um, but sadly that doesn't really happen. Um, and so it's really only upon her poetry being recovered in the late 20th century by scholars interested um, in sort of lost in inverted commas um, women's uh, voices uh, especially in literature that people started paying attention again to her work um, as I've mentioned though Naden did aspire towards influence and she considered it the philosopher's duty to aspire to social good which for her meant demonstrating the universal nature of human consciousness and by extension addressing inequalities her increasingly political activities upon moving to London were indicative of this broader purpose and she became involved in an association supporting the social progress and female education in India. She canvassed for a liberal parliamentary candidate. She attended Fabian Society meetings, uh, was associated with Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and spoke in favour of women's suffrage. Um, unfortunately, um, this uh, lecture on the question of the vote was not recorded, um, but many of her poems articulate a clear proto-feminist stance. Um, but it's nonetheless, I think, important to note that none of Naden's essays, at least, stray into the territory of unambiguously feminist philosophy. 
uh, Ruth Hagengruber, uh, writing in 2020, observed that the history of philosophy has tended to, quote, classify women's writings as philosophically relevant only if they targeted specific and particular gender issues. And so perhaps counterintuitively, Naden's desire to think in terms of universals and humanity as a whole may have been detrimental to her reception, um, if we think about sort of the way that women have tended to feature in the history of philosophy. Nonetheless, I return to this slide. There's been much recent work shown on the direct and indirect relations between Nathan's philosophical works and those of other um, 19th century philosophers and particularly women philosophers about mind and its place in the world. Um, for example, uh, Stone's, uh, Alison Stone's uh, article on later 19th century women philosophers on mind and its place in the world concludes, just as Naden's position emerges dialectically out of problems in Cobb-style dualism, likewise Blavatsky's and Besant's panpsychism emerges dialectically out of problems in Naden-style materialism. So this sort of dialecticism um, is really um, clear here where we can draw out these sort of networks of thought. And uh, Ermtraud Huber asserts that, quote, the radicalism of Naden's holistic proposition, I think, has hardly been properly appreciated so far. And she makes a connection with Karen Barad's work on the interactions and entanglements of matter and meaning and the inseparability of the ontological, epistemological and ethical questions um, that arise. In her conclusion, Huber asks, perhaps provocatively, does not the new ontology heralded by new materialists in the 21st century share some ground with Naden's vision where she breaks down all existence to the relations of matter and simultaneous grants to all matter, all agency and all wonder? Huber contends that new materialism could profit from con confronting such historical predecessors as Naden um, and how she attempted to face, quote, the ethical challenge of materialism that continues to be unresolved. So Naden's contributions to synthetic philosophy, materialist metaphysics and secular ethics are only really now being considered in a sustained and serious way. As I started by saying, it's exciting to see just how far these things have come since my book was published uh, just less than five years ago. And um, personally, I'm looking forward to seeing how continued attention to her diverse writings open up other avenues. And I hope that this uh, presentation has highlighted some of the ways in which her works might fit into the teaching of philosophy in order to facilitate future scholarship. Thank you.